space this morning. Uh, so we'll, we'll be praying that uh, you can keep going for the last chair this evening. Uh, it's great that you're here. We want to thank you just for coming and sharing your expertise on early church history. And we're looking forward to that week of lectures. And uh, I know that some of you are here maybe just for this Sunday night lecture, open lecture. But if you are interested in attending during the week or if this lecture itself whets your appetite, do speak to Joy or myself. And uh, we can see what can arrange so that you can come along during the week as well. Uh, just before Cullman comes, uh, we do want to say a little bit about uh, Thomas DeLong uh, tonight, just before uh, the lecture begins. Uh, we've chosen to call our lectures, uh, which uh, these open lectures, which are three times a year, the DeLong lectures. And it's no kind of reference to uh, brass or anything like that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a telling about a particular individual in history uh, by the name of Thomas DeLong, who is uh, known to be the first uh, Irish Baptist martyr. And Thomas DeLong was born in a very turbulent time in history uh, in the 17th century, 1600s. And when you think of the backdrop of what was happening at that particular time in history in the UK and Ireland, uh, you realise how uh, politics and the church was wrapped up very tightly together. There was a lot of conflict uh, and there was a lot of falling out and fighting and indeed there was civil war in England at that particular time. So when we think of Thomas de Long, we think of a guy who was born just north uh, east of Bandon in County Cork in the townland of Brinney. He was born and brought up in what would have been known as a farming estate that was run by a particular major Riggs that we read about in the old church book. He was a, a major in the Nemo Army, which was set up in England when the Parliament took over from the monarchy after the Civil War, which was around the 1640s. And as Major Briggs settled into Ireland and made sure that there was no shenanigans going on in Ireland at that time, he also uh, owned this estate. And he took a shine to Thomas uh, DeLorme as he was growing up and realised that this guy had a lot of potential. And so Thomas DeLorme would attend Bible studies at Major Briggs' home because Major Briggs was a, 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 a Christian Baptist. And through that, Thomas DeLong came to faith. And he was then eventually also, by the age of 16, he was employed by uh, Major Riggs. And uh, he was supported as well up to the age of 16 in all of his education by money from Major Riggs. But when he came to faith, he began to struggle and suffer because he underwent some persecution, hard times uh, around the estate and from his family to the point uh, which by the, uh, roughly about his late teens or so, after working a little bit in Cork, he moved to London. And when he moved to London, uh, he met another Baptist pastor's daughter, married, settled down, had children, and uh, settled into uh, a life where he uh, set up a small grammar school. He was part of a what was known as a particular Baptist church in London, and he, he settled there, served there, did, uh, began to develop a writing uh, as well. He, he wrote a lot of pamphlets, and uh, he, he got involved in, in things in that way. But what we find, because of this particular time in history, Thomas has left Ireland because he was being persecuted by his own family and his own people of that particular background. And then he moves to London and he finds that he, now as a, a Christian with Baptist convictions about how church is governed, is now under pressure because of those convictions and because of some of the things that he was writing concerning his convictions about the gospel, Christian faith, and about church form and government. So he's beginning to be persecuted now by the new monarchy that comes in place after a period of about 10 years in the mid 1600s in England where the uh, country was, was governed by Parliament. King Charles comes back onto the throne about 1658, and by 1660, around that time, there's the Act of Conformity, 
uh, where it was demanded, it was indeed in law, that anybody who worshipped in England at that time must adhere to the common book, book of prayer. But as a Baptist and as many others, independents, Congregationalists, Presbyterians didn't agree with this law. A lot of uh, Christians, uh, a lot of the evangelical community at that time suffered. And so Thomas uh, writes a particular tract in response to a Church of England minister by the name of Calamy, who says really that anybody who doesn't belong to the Church of England is silly and uh, they should be uh, sent to jail. And as a result of that, uh, Thomas Long writes his track called A Plea for, uh, um, for Nonconformity. And uh, as a result of writing that, he ends up in Newgate Jail. And he is fined close to 80 euro because he was accused through the courts of sedition because of the power of the monarchy and because of the desire of the monarchy at that time to make everybody conform to a particular structure of worship which was connected to the Church of England. And sadly, really, the end uh, of uh, Thomas DeLong's life is very pitiful and sad in one respect because within 15 months of being put into Newgate Prison, which was notoriously bad, bad place to be because you just didn't survive there because of the lack of hygiene and everything else. His family are moved into the prison, his wife Hannah and their three children, and within 15 months of being put there, by 1685, Thomas de Long passed away, together with his children and his wife, and he was the last one to survive. And as a, as a fitting uh, footnote, to the story of Thomas de Long, by 1706, the writer of Robinson Crusoe, a Presbyterian and a dissenter, the name of Daniel Defoe, I'm sure you know, he wrote a preface uh, in one particular publication of Thomas de Long's A Plea for Nonconformity and asked a very interesting question, a troubling question perhaps for us today, as we think about what we learned this morning with Martin Sermon other things uh, that we think about that is important uh, to be a Christian. Uh, Daniel Defoe asks the question uh, when he is referring to Thomas de Long and, his, and he's obviously promoting the work that he's prefacing, this plea for nonconformity, he asks, where were the Baptists when Thomas de Long was put into prison? Why didn't they pay his fine? It was 80 euros, substantial sum, but it looks as if he was fairly well deserted by the time he was put into prison. And so, in summing up, and before I hand on to Kelman, I think it's interesting to think of Thomas de Long, by, through whom we name these uh, Sunday night lectures, as a person who was persecuted for his faith, but he was consistently persecuted by different factions and indeed some church groupings that we are familiar with today still. But to some degree it includes ourselves because he wasn't looked after by his own people. That's a challenge to all of us, isn't it? That as we seek to persevere, to be patient as we were thinking about this morning as we go on in the faith, that we also are careful to love and care for one another. I know that Thomas is with the Lord and he was faithful to him and it's good to name our lectures after him. But it's also a challenge as we remember him that we stay true to the faith, that we're not afraid of our convictions as Baptists concerning how we understand what it is to become a Christian, what baptism is, what uh, church government is. And it's just an encouragement to, re to remind us as we think of that man how we can continue to love one another and show that we're, we love Christ by loving one another. So that's just a brief biography, if you like, of Thomas DeLong. We hope to get something up on the website. Uh, Michael Haken has written a short page uh, or an article just on the life of Thomas DeLong, so we may try and get that up on the website shortly. But uh, other than that, I'm just going to pray and then kind of come. Let's go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example that you leave us 
through your life, through the writings of the New Testament especially, when we see what love truly is, when we think of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ coming here and living here and willingly giving up his life for us. Lord, we thank you. And we pray that you would help us as we even come here tonight and think about the sacrifice of your people in the past, that we would be encouraged to think less of ourselves and more of this great plan that you have given us to partake in, which is your plan to make you known around the world. And Lord, I pray that you would be with Coleman as he speaks with us. I know, Lord, that he's probably very tired. <coughs> we pray that you give him strength and help us, Lord, to appreciate this time and to listen well and to learn from your people in the past. We pray that we would all do this because of a motivation to want to love you and serve you better. So we we'll ask all of these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, God. Well, thank you, Andy. And uh, just want to say greetings from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, I want you to know that people will pray for you there, uh, and they look forward to seeing the work that is done here continually, and uh, so there's, a, there's an affinity for what's happening here in Cork and in Ireland with the Irish Baptists, so um, I, I am just honored to be here as, as maybe a small little piece of that. So um, one of my professors in seminary uh, used to say that he would be the one, he would be part of this Founders Week of all these, you know, legendary professors, and he would be the, uh, there would be like the, the, the ultimate New Testament professor and the ultimate systematic professor, and then it would be him. And he said, you, you put me in front of all these canons, and now I'm just a little pop gun. So that's how I kind of feel today. So um, hopefully this will be fruitful for you, uh, and I've already enjoyed my time so far. So um, I would love to just piggyback off of what uh, Brother Martin preached this morning and, and to reread the passage that we talked about during uh, worship. So that's James 5. <clears throat> As I think this is very fitting for where we're going to go tonight and what we're going to talk about. Um, just real quick, a little bit about me. Um, uh, I, I hail from originally Texas. Uh, I know you can tell with the accent. Um, and uh, the cowboy boots I'm wearing. No, not really. Um, it is the land of cowboys in more ways than one, both American football and people who actually think they are cowboys. Um, ironically, they drive Mercedes Benzes, so. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so my wife Alex and I are very honored to be here, and um, we um, uh, working on, both working on doctoral programs, and I've been honored to work with a man, Michael Haken, uh, in early church history. It's a passion that I, I've had for a while, and a love that I have continued to garner for the early church and the witness of the early church, especially in the topic that we're going to discuss tonight. So let me read the passage, and then we'll continue on. I'll start in verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Verse 12, But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. I think verse 12 is really important for understanding Christian martyrdom in the early church and especially the desire uh, to be a witness for Christ. Uh, especially the yes, yes, and the no, no passage there. And if you're taking the course this week, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but I hope to at least offer some insight into, really, what is the value of these Christian martyr stories? If any of you have read any of these, we have some famous ones uh, that we'll briefly touch on. Uh, but I think there's much value in these stories. Uh, we're not going to get into details about the style in which they are written. Some of them are fairly embellished. Uh, but we're going to look at the, the core uh, story that is, is contained within. And more specifically, we're going to start off our time looking at one who wrote on, on his way to martyrdom, that is Ignatius of Antioch, and the encouragement that he was giving to Christians, and the encouragement I think that we can learn from 
by his example. So uh, I may have some words in here that, uh, that I may need to define for you, and if there's a word that uh, I'd, I'd breeze over and I don't define for you, then feel free to you know, say, hey, what was that word again? I'd love to know what that is, uh, but I'll do my best to help kind of make that smooth for everyone here. So uh, the title of this presentation is, and you'll understand what this is in a, in a moment, but attuned to the bishop as strings to a lyre, imitation and Christian virtue in the letters of Ignatius of Antioch. Um, so I have a handout that's there for everybody, so you can take notes. Uh, I don't have a handout for the second part of the presentation, but you can use the back if you want to take notes as well. So, um, Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch, writing about early 2nd century, so around 107 uh, is when he died, um, to various churches throughout Asia Minor in the 2nd century, presents a vision for church unity and flourishing. In many ways, this vision is not unique. It's reflective of many Pauline parallels for church order and moral witness. In other ways, it, it is quite unique, actually, demonstrating a contextually based theological vision from a writer who was just one generation separated from the apostolic ministry. I think that's significant. So for this reason, Ignatius continues to be a figure of interest for those who wish to build a bridge between the New Testament Christian practice and those of the subsequent generations. So how were those that were right after the, the apostles, the, the first generation of the church, how were they receiving these acts? How were they um, envisioning Christian discipleship and specifically when it came to martyrdom? So I hope to address even a couple myths, as it were, when it comes to Christian martyrdom uh, in this, this time tonight. So, um, so much has been written on this, this individual. And, and what, what is interesting for Ignatius is a lot of people want to see what they want to find in Ignatius. So, for instance, we have one uh, scholar, actually a lot of scholars, particularly Roman Catholic scholars, will look at Ignatius and they'll say, aha, look, someone who is promoting an early church uh, version, vision of Episcopal authority, so someone who's ruled by a bishop and some other things that go along with that. Um, that is in there, but what's, why is it in there? What's he talking about? Is it unbiblical? Uh, is it right for us to, to look at these things and to try to draw some principles out of? Um, or is it just an a, a, a early understanding of some later Roman Catholic understanding of ecclesiology? We'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, but many people have sought to employ Ignatius for their own purposes. Um, still others focus on Ignatius' view of early Christianity's relationship to Judaism. He's got a lot to say there. Uh, other people want to find out his view of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist as it's called, uh, and what did, what did he believe? Uh, those are important for Ignatius, but we're not going to focus primarily on those tonight. Specifically, I want to focus on how did Ignatius envision the Christian life? How did he envision growth in Christ-likeness, or what I'm going to call Christian virtue, uh, is, is a term that the early church readily used and, and was comfortable with. Uh, so for Ignatius, based on the incarnation of Christ and his subsequent body known as the church, what is the best way to live, according to Ignatius? And I think this is a moral question, one with which I believe Ignatius was primarily preoccupied. So let me give a brief um, uh, summary of the life of Ignatius. So this second century martyr appears to us as somewhat of a mystery, like a meteor which has traveled through space for eons, only to briefly blaze across our sky, he expires in, quote, a shower of fire, as one scholar puts it. The only glimpse that we receive of him comes from his seven epistles. So he wrote seven epistles to various churches in Asia Minor and to Rome. Uh, and, that's, and that's where we can discern a little bit about him. En route, that is, to his martyrdom in Rome. So he wrote no dialogues or expounded on any facet of Christian theology at length, but Ignatius has become for us a window into the world of post-apocalyptic, sorry, apostolic uh, Christianity. We were talking about blood moons earlier, I guess that's on my brain. Uh, <laughs> so focusing on this discussion, um, we're going to look at, uh, first off, how did he envision discipleship as a, in the Christian life? Uh, but back to an introduction. 
In his letters, Ignatius presents a model of, of three-tiered church leadership, like we discussed. That is, churches led by a single bishop with a council of elders and deacons. This is going to be important when it comes to the question of imitation and virtue. I'm going to move this along. Um, and, and in this apparently disparate ecclesiology, that is the theology of the church or understanding of the church, uh, it's disparate because it seems to some of us, maybe as we read it today, if you've read it, you might see this, that it doesn't seem to quite match up with New Testament v- version of the church. Maybe not even what our Baptist version of the church leadership would be. Um, and I'm, I'll challenge that a little bit. Uh, and so this has led some people to think that Ignatius wrote these letters in the late second century. And this is important because they see this really developed uh, church leadership model, and they say there's no way that Ignatius wrote in the f- early second century. He must have written it late second century. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, scholars agree that Ignatius wrote this early second century, specifically during the emperor of Trajan. Again, that's important. So another fact, Ignatius was a bishop. He was a leader of the church. We would maybe call it a head pastor, an overseer, uh, specifically at Antioch. Uh, some th- say that perhaps Peter himself appointed him there, but there's really only just a little bit of evidence for that, and that's much later in the Christian tradition that says that. Uh, so history does not uh, record the uh, events that led to his arrest, so he was arrested in order to be sent to Rome for his, uh, for his death, but presumably an outbreak of local persecution arose, and as the leader of the community, Ignatius was singled out for execution. So being a bishop, being an overseer, being a lead pastor in the church at this time was not always a desired role, right? So I think that's why uh, the New Testament consistently uh, calls uh, those who wish to be church leaders to consider that weightiness, that role uh, with, uh, with, with gravity, understanding how, how uh, much of a responsibility that is. Uh, so, so he writes as a concern, this is important for us, I think, he writes these seven epistles as a concerned pastor rather than a controlling force. Many people will read the, the epistles to Ignatius and think that he's trying to control people by what he writes. He's trying to weave his own theological agenda, and I don't th- I could, th- that's further from the truth, in my opinion. Um, so any agenda that Ignatius might have had is best discerned as a shepherd concerned with the health of the church that he loves in order to promote the gospel for which he was giving his life. Not only the example of Ignatius's testimony, but also the concepts for which he so passionately contends are worthy of investigation, specifically when it comes to Christian formation or understanding how to grow in Christian character. So I'm going to I'm going to be using the word the term virtue and and I mean that in the best sense. I think a lot of times we can read that word and think that has to do with works of earning our salvation, but in in an early Christian understanding, this is really just a fulfillment of what maybe Greek moral philosophers were talking about. It's a fulfillment because Christ himself lived this out. He lived out perfect virtue. Paul talks about the virtues of faith, hope and love. Uh, and in other places, he talks about putting on these virtues um, in, in his epistles. So, so Christian virtue is, is literally Christ-likeness, growing in Christ-likeness. So in his letters, Ignatius is concerned with the unity of the church and the holiness of each local congregation. That these two facets are intimately connected in the mind of Ignatius. The holiness of the body, both corporately and the individual's, serve to uphold the unity necessary to further promote uh, the the growth of the church and the growth of of the spiritual life. So Ignatius, and I love this, he uses rich musical metaphors. That's where the title comes from, attuned to the bishop as strings to a lyre. He uses this to describe this concept of the harmony of the church. So think of of a harp or a stringed instrument that is perfectly in tune, and as you play the chord, you hear all the, the harmonious uh, tones that come forth from that instrument. That's the image that Ignatius is portraying here. Uh, he says this quote, he says, in order that we may run together in harmony with the mind of God. This harmony with God is displayed in each local church's mutual submission to their God-appointed leadership. So when you read the epistles of Ignatius, and by the way, the epistles of Ignatius are available for free online online. 
So if you want to search those out or if you want recommendations on where to find those, please talk to me and I'd love to make those available to you. There's also printed volumes of Ignatius' letters as well, but uh, the, the free access online is hard to pass up. So, um, so as I quote, I put the, I put, um, I'll, be, I'll be sorry, I put a few of the uh, references on the screen. Uh, what I would love for you to do is if you had time later this week is to go, when you find a free version online, like a PDF version or uh, a, a web page version, is to go and put those in and see exactly what he's saying here. But I'll quote them uh, as, as we go along. So this harmony with God is displayed in each local church's mutual submission to their God-appointed leadership. So since Jesus Christ is in the mind of the Father and the bishops are in the mind of Christ, it is only natural for believers to, quote, run together in harmony with the mind of a bishop. And remember, what, when Ignatius is using the word bishop, he's using the same word that Paul uses in 1 Timothy 3 he's, as episkopos, overseer. So we, what he really has in mind here is the overseer of the church, the person that is responsible for uh, the, 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 the main tasks of the church, preaching, uh, the Lord's Supper, baptizing, those kind of things. But he doesn't just end there. This harmony with the bishop, as well as the presbyters, that is the elders, are, uh, are he, this is the quote again, are those who are tuned to the bishop as strings to a lyre, and it leads to unanimity and harmonious love, in which, quote, Jesus Christ is sung. So imagine this, everybody. Imagine the unified church where you are so harmonious that your acts display Jesus Christ as being sung, a beautiful song to the world to see how wonderful this melody is of which we are all participants. This is the kind of image that, uh, that Ignatius is trying to portray here. So this theme is repeated throughout his letters. As Ignatius implores his hearers, he says this, be eager to do everything in godly harmony, a great reminder for us. Ignatius further implores his hearers to this harmony and states, you must join this chorus, every one of you, so that by being harmonious in unanimity and by taking your pitch from God, you may sing in unison with one voice through Jesus Christ to the Father in order that he may both hear you and on the basis of what you do well, acknowledge that you are members of his Son. It is therefore advantageous for you to be in perfect unity in order that you may always have a share in God. And that comes from his epistle to the Ephesians, chapter four. So godliness for Ignatius includes harmonious living in the church. Only when in harmony with church leaders and fellow believers can Christians truly experience growth. Those who do anything apart from church leadership, quote, do not have a clean conscience. And that's in his letter to the Tralians, chapter seven. The ideal of harmony comes both from the Trinitarian view of God, as Ignatius notes in his letter to the Ephesians, as well as a following of the commands of God. Regarding the bishop to Philadelphia, he says this, he, that bishop, is attuned to the commandments as a harp to the strings. So you can see, again, he's just using this imagery to draw this point home, and I think it's helpful for us today. So maybe in worship one Sunday as you were watching a band leader play guitar or something that you may use that's a stringed instrument, I hope that image comes back to mind. So that instrument being in tune, a harmonious chord is being played, that's how we are supposed to act in our church fellowship and worship. I think it's very neat. Um, so for, for godliness, uh, Ignatius has a unifying purpose. Uh, he says, for him, the sheep, according to Ignatius, should follow their shepherd. Again, a New Testament theme we see all over the place. Um, there's, there's specific issues that he wishes to address to people. Throughout the extent of his letters, he implores believers to a Christocentric life in a unified community. You cannot have a full Christ-centered life in a disharmonious church. Now, you can still, I think, have um, a, a better uh, life than not being in the church, right? But if you're striving for godliness, you're supposed to be striving together. Uh, and that's what Ignatius envisions for those who are reading his letters. Um, so he says this to the Magnesians. He says, let all of you run together as to the one temple of God, as to the one altar, that is Jesus Christ, who came forth from the Father and remained with the one and returned to the one. Ignatius has a real high Christology. He sees Jesus Christ as the exalted Lord, and that's all throughout his letters. 
Underneath this basic paradigm is the witness of the apostles and the reality of Christ's incarnation. So he doesn't just say these things apart from the apostolic witness and an explicit understanding of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The incarnation is foundational for Ignatius and it is a driving force throughout all his letters. He cannot make these assertions apart from understanding that doctrine. <clears throat> so the incarnation of Christ and the Trinitarian economy of God provide, provide this foundation for moral exhortation. Virtue, apart from this foundation, is a sham virtue. Any supposed display of godliness, apart from the unified body of Christ, led by the threefold offices of church leadership, are illegitimate, divisive, and immoral, according to Ignatius. So, imitation. The idea of imitation of Ignatius is also very important for developing Christ-like character. So Ignatius repeatedly calls his readers to imitation as a growth, as a means to growth in godliness. A good argument can be made for a distinctly Pauline theme in Ignatius' imitation motif. So we know that we are to follow Paul as Paul follows Christ. It's very similar with Ignatius. So to the Ephesians, he says they are to be imitators, compelled to the task that was uh, natural for them. He, he says this to the Ephesians to encourage them. They were imitators of God and Jesus Christ. Uh, the act of love following the example of Christ thus becomes a naturally expressed virtue. This has parallels to Paul's exhortation to the Ephesian church just a generation before. So just think about this. He's calling upon the Ephesian church to remember what, essentially what Paul told them just a generation before. I mean, they have those texts, right? They have the letter that Paul wrote to them. And essentially, Ignatius is imploring them to go back and read that, reread that. Think about those things. He's, he's calling those things to mind for them. So this expression of corporate love comes primarily through this person, uh, in the, this bishop rather, in the Ephesian church by the name of Onesimus. And it's likely not the same Onesimus that we see in his, uh, his epistle to Philemon. It's probably someone else, although some people have made that connection. I don't know if that's legitimate or not. Um, but either way, that was his name. So this leader of the group showed, quote, inexpressible love in accordance with the standard set by Jesus Christ and is therefore worthy of imitation. So he's calling the Ephesian church, imitate your leader, because he imitates Christ. The imitative relationship here is cyclical. The corporate body, imitating Christ, has expressed their love to Ignatius, chiefly through sending their bishop. So as Ignatius is going on his way to Rome for martyrdom, the Ephesian church sends forth their leadership in order to meet Ignatius, in order to uh, tend to his needs, in order to uh, encourage him and pray for him. And so that's how they showed their love, through sending their leadership. Again, he himself was a standard, this is Onesimus, was a standard of Christ and should be imitated. Ignatius observes similar things in his letter to the Tralians, who are, quote, imitators of God. And when they demonstrate that they are subject to their bishop, they are, quote, living not in accordance with human standards, but in accordance with Jesus Christ. That's in Tralians chapter 1, verse 2. Thus it seems as though the relationship of imitation includes both God and those whom God has appointed to serve as, quote, models of the Father. So those who are seeking out pastors for their churches. The question to ask is, are they modeling the Father? Are they modeling the love of God in their life? That is an important question for Ignatius. So Ignatius, likewise, praises his hearers for not imitating those who speak untruthfully about Jesus Christ. He says, those are mad dogs that bite by stealth, whose bite is hard to heal, he says to the Ephesians in chapter 9. These ones, quote, adulterously corrupt households who have polluted themselves and, quote, will go to the unquenchable fire and do so, uh, and, and those also who follow them. In Ignatius, Ephesians chapter 16. Likewise, the Ephesians should, quote, not be eager to imitate the deeds of unbelievers, but rather be eager to be imitators of the Lord. This imitation of the Lord, which bears wrongdoing and rejection, culminates in a call to live with, quote, complete purity and self-control, abiding in Jesus Christ both physically and spiritually. So imitation has effects. When you're imitating Jesus Christ, you have 
uh, the effects of purity, of self-control, of love, as he's mentioned previously. So Ignatius relates the goodness of Christ as the model, the model of imitation. He relates, for if he were to imitate the way we act, we are lost. So if Jesus Christ was to imitate man, there'd be no hope. But if we imitate Christ, then we have hope growing in Christ-likeness and virtue. So much of his language here of imitation centers on the role of the overseer and also the church leaders. So again, to the Tralians, he says, they should follow the elders as as if they were the apostles of Jesus Christ. And then he says to the bishop in the Philadelphian church that that he has a godly mind, which is, quote, virtuous and perfect, and as one who has, quote, steadfast character. The implication here is that this overseer is worthy of imitation. Likewise, to the Smyrnians, he calls for obedience to the bishop in a way that imitates the son's submission to the father. So uh, relating the image of Philippians 2, where Christ put aside his, uh, his rights as God and made himself a servant. It's that same idea that Ignatius is drawing upon here. So for Ignatius, this guarantees against evil division, which is contrary to the nature of God and thus the goal of the church. So I'm going to use a couple technical terms here. The first one is paranasis and protrepsis. So I'll define what these mean and why they're important for understanding Ignatius and our growth in Christian character. So there's some additional considerations we need to make in order to understand the nature of moral formation in the letters of Ignatius. The literary notions of protrepsis and paranasis help us to this end. So the concepts of protrepsis and paranasis draw attention to the manner in which the writer conveys moral direction. So for instance, protreptic literature, quote, urges the reader to convert to a way of life to join a school, or accept a set of teachings as normative for the reader's life. Perinesis, from a Greek word perineo, is a technical term describing a literary style that offers a moral and ethical exhortation based on common religious or moral convictions. So even though these terms originated in Greco-Roman moral literature, they were ultimately appropriated for, for right reasons in Jewish and early Christian literature in order to greatly understand uh, Ignatius' ethical exhortation. So throughout his letters, Ignatius offers a paranasis to his readers, imploring them to greater acts of virtue. So a good way to, to, to think about this is, is pointing the way. So paranasis points the way to a virtue or points the way to uh, an act or, or, or a, a, a right philosophy of living. To the Ephesians, he encourages them to continue praying for the salvation of humankind. Prayer should be coupled with action, though, instruction by means of their deeds. Each evil act should be met with an equally virtuous act, according to Ignatius. That is, gentleness for anger, or humility for pride, prayers for slander, and civilized action for cruelty. Uh, and when I read that, and it's in Ephesians 10, verse 1 and 2, uh, I hear voices of the Sermon on the Mount. I, I hear Jesus saying, blessed are those who persecute you. You know, uh, praying for our enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Ignatius is, is communicating very similar themes. So paranetic language often centers around unification and obedience to church leadership, as we previously discussed. So to the Magnesian church, Ignatius encourages them to, quote, be firmly grounded in the precepts of the Lord and the apostles, along with the bishop, along with the council of elders, and, quote, the godly deacons. Following this, Ignatius implores to subject him, implores his readers to subject themselves to the bishop and, quote, to one another. So he's not just saying that the bishop or the overseer is going to be the Lord over you. He's saying, as you also submit to your leadership, you submit to one another, right? In order to care for each other's needs, in order to put other needs before your own. Uh, Again, Philippians 2 comes to mind in that that understanding. Uh, Following, this was just as Christ was subject to the Father and the apostles to Christ, that same kind of imagery. Uh, 
Similarly, to the Tralians, he urges his hearers to do nothing without the bishop and to, quote, be subject also to the council of the elders and the, as if to the apostles of Jesus Christ. So the idea here is, is don't go in secret and do something without your church leadership. He's, he's not saying you can't have a meeting and your, your pastor, you know, if he's not there, it's not a legitimate meeting. But the idea of this is, is going behind your pastor's back, going and planning things in the dark. So do nothing without your bishop, essentially meaning don't do anything in secret apart from the uh, blessing and the understanding that your church leadership gives towards your, uh, towards your gathering. So the protreptic nature of Ignatius's letters often come in negative pronouncements regarding alternate ways of life. So whereas Paranasus may point to something or uh, bring some alongside and say, this is good, you should do this, Ignatius, with protreptic language, says, this is not what you do. So pointing at a, a negative way of life, uh, bringing someone out of it. So whereas a Paranasus would pull someone in, to a, a philosophy, a right way of living, Protreptic would try to pull someone out. And I think that's a good way to understand it. So these are the false teachers regarding the person and work of Christ and the ethical consequences of disbelief. So for Ignatius, and I think this is really important for us, that if, if, if we are not believing right Christian doctrine, there are ethical consequences to this. If we are not understanding the basics of Trinitarian theology and, and the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if we start to lose those things, there are ethical consequences to that as well. And I think that's demonstrated in the New Testament and with Ignatius. So these teachers, quote, have no concern for love, none for the widow, none for the orphan, none for the oppressed, none for the prisoner or the one released, none for the hungry or the thirsty, these are the ethical consequences for disbelieving the incarnation. That is, a denial of care for those in the flesh. So what's Ignatius saying here? He's saying if you don't believe that Jesus Christ didn't come, came in the flesh, if you don't believe that he came in the flesh, then you are going to treat others as if their fleshly concerns don't matter. And I think that's something that we need to understand today. Right? So if we truly believe in the incarnation of Christ, if we truly believe in the resurrection of our Lord, that he was 100% man and 100% God, then that should affect how we conduct our ethical life in the church and outside the church. And that's what Ignatius is trying to say. So regarding these ones, these are flesh deniers who will ultimately, quote, perish in their conscientiousness, contentiousness, rather, though Ignatius extends a word of hope that even they too would learn to love and experience resurrection of life. So he is denouncing them, but he's also saying they could still come to the a knowledge of the truth. So regarding these one, Ignatius implores his hearers to hold fast to the gospel, which includes the confession of the suffering and risen Christ, not allowing false teachers a public or even a private hearing. And he says this in his uh, epistle of Smyrna 7-2. Similarly, he implores Polycarp to stand firm, quote, like an anvil against those who, quote, teach strange doctrines. And you see this also with Paul writing to Timothy and Titus to, to guard the doctrine, guard the sound deposit of words that have been entrusted to you. And this is a theme that is consistent in the New Testament writings, and Ignatius is likewise replicating this. So I think something else to remember that's helpful is is when we talk about Christian formation and when we talk about Christian virtue, we do need to have a healthy understanding of the will, a healthy understanding of human action. So just a brief word on this. So it is worth mentioning something about this from an Ignatian perspective. So traditional virtue formation, if you look at moral philosophy, maybe of Aristotle or some modern moral philosophers, they posit numerous components that lead to action. There's numerous steps that happen in the person's mind in order to come to action, if you read Greco-Roman moral philosophy. So in one respect, for Ignatius, the will and human action is directly related to endurance. In this regard, the goal is to reach God, and Christians are called to, quote, patiently endure all the abuse of the ruler of this age and escape. With the prophets as an example, Christians, quote, patiently endure in order that they may be found to be disciples of Jesus Christ. 
to Polycarp, he calls his elder, his bishop friend rather, to patiently bear all things. Be more diligent than you are now and wait expectantly for the one who is above time. Very similar to the passage we read in James from Brother Martin this morning. So this action is founded upon the belief of the incarnate Christ who suffered and endured on our behalf. So if we truly believe that Christ is risen and that he is coming again, we have a desire to act in a certain way, specifically to endure in the hope that we have. So that affects the decisions we make. That affects the, the things that we choose to do with uh, our time and our resources uh, and our relationships, what we prioritize. So that's what Ignatius is trying to get to. So Ignatius everywhere recognizes the relationship between action and virtue. So virtue, you can have virtue, but no one would know if you had virtue unless you acted. So that's a, a key part of what Ignatius is trying to say. So for Ignatius, righteous deeds are in fact, they are voluntary deeds, yet they are not actions dissociated from Christocentric motivation. So they don't just arise out of your heart because you're a good person. They arise because Christ has changed you into a new person. So there's a Christocentric motivation. So he echoes Jesus' words in Matthew 12, and he says this, quote, the tree is known by its fruit. Thus those who profess to be Christ's will, Christ's will be recognized by their actions. For the work is a matter not of what one promises now, but of persevering to the end in the power of faith. Ephesians 14.2 is where that comes from. I don't have it on there. Um, Ignatius entreats Polycarp not to, quote, not only to flee from wicked practices, so personally not to practice certain things, but to preach a sermon imploring others to do the same. So preach a sermon that causes people to go out and act on these things, act on true doctrine. Such a, sh uh, such a sermon should call hearers to, quote, uh, to things like marital faithfulness, chastity, humility, and a God-honoring life from uh, Ignatius to Polycarp, chapter 5. So Ignatius engages the idea of the will in numerous places. Christians must choose to act like a Christian, quote, not just be called Christians. That is a consistent reminder for the ages. Additionally, the two ways languages, language in the letter to the Magnesius appeals to man's will to act. So when I talk about two ways, I talk about this idea in the early church understanding that there are two ways of life which come straight from the testimony and the teaching of Jesus Christ, right? Two ways of life. One is the way of life, and there's numerous things that indicate that you are on that way of life, primarily confession of faith in Jesus Christ, but then the actions that go with that. And then there's the way of death. So it's someone who is consistently turned against God and the actions that are displayed in that way of death. So he's using this kind of imagery here in, in this area. Uh, so again, those who have been stamped with the image of God the Father through Jesus Christ must, quote, voluntarily choose to die into his suffering. Voluntary language in this passage highlights the nature of this two ways understanding. One can either walk down this path, that is the way of life, uh, and have godly virtue and actions that coincide with that, or one can walk down the way of death and have uh, actions that demonstrate that you are not following the will of God. In fact, <coughs> this protreptic nature of much of his writing displays an understanding of this voluntary action. Though founded upon the example of Christ, members of the body must choose to act in accordance with a Christ-like life. A Christocentric life demands Christocentric action. So just a couple more things that I want to uh, touch on here, and then I'm going to conclude this passage, this part, and then move into a time of understanding how later Christians, particularly in the fourth century, drew upon stories such as Ignatius's. So this is Ignatius writing himself, but we're going to go 300 years in the future, not for us, but for Ignatius, uh, and look at how 4th century preachers preached about these people, and it, for the same reason, to draw out Christian virtue. So just a few things to consider. Uh, Ignatius uses other language that is important for virtue. Uh, to the Magnesians, he praises their, quote, well-ordered love towards God. The idea of well-ordered love points to a later tradition of moral reflection that is particularly from Augustine and other fathers regarding the nature of human passions in light of the fall. 
So they, for Ignatius, these people understand what it means to love rightly in all areas of their life, not privileging one area to the neglect of the other. So rightly ordering their passions, the, the things that are in their life, uh, is, a, is a theme that Augustine later will, will talk about. Uh, Ignatius also testifies to a prophetic utterance in the spirit regarding imitation and virtue. And we don't have time to get into this, but Ignatius confesses that the Spirit told him this. Accordance, according to this testimony, the Spirit calls for unity among the body. My, my personal opinion is that Ignatius is, he, which he may have felt like he had this understanding from the Spirit that is, uh, was personal to him, nothing that he says is contrary to Scripture in that sense. Uh, he's, I think he's really just invoking the fact that the Spirit has said this, that the Spirit confirms this, right? I mean, if we were in the church, we would all confirm, I hope, the need for unity, the need to work towards unity. So I, I tend to think that's what Ignatius is saying here. Uh, he says this, this is, the Spirit gave him this to say, do nothing without your overseer. Guard your bodies as the temple of God. You should love unity, flee from divisions, and become imitators of Jesus Christ, just as he is of the Father. That's in his epistle to Philippians chapter 7. This string of imperative commands, supposedly prompted by the Spirit, raises some very interesting questions. So does he believe he's presenting a prophetic utterance, or is this just a way to confirm the teaching? Uh, and again, I think this is a way to confirm the teaching that he's already said. He doesn't ultimately answer these questions, and the presence of a potentially spirit-informed call to virtuous living opens up how early Christians conceive of the role of the spirit towards virtue formation. So this is a big topic. We don't have time to get into this, but it is important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit does have a role in prompting us to Christian virtue. Uh, specifically, I think of a prayer that I often pray is, is, is a, in a prayer of forgiveness. You know, Lord, forgive me for the things I've done that I shouldn't have done. But then also, forgive me for the things that I didn't do that I should have done. And maybe you've heard that prayer or prayed something similar. That's, you understood that this action needed to happen and you neglected it. So we need forgiveness for that just as much as we need forgiveness for the explicit sins, the commission sins that we commit. Um, and, and I think that's a helpful thing for us to consider. We just don't have time to get into it tonight. So just to conclude this time, this section here, um, you know, reading the letters of Ignatius, again, I, I implore you, if, if you're just here tonight and, and you're getting hopefully something from this, I do hope, um, what I would implore you to do is to go home uh, and, and I can help you with this later this week if there's enough people that want this, I can make it available to you, is to go home and read some of these, uh, these passages that I've highlighted here and just to see what Ignatius is trying to do here. Um, and, and we have to remember, this is not scripture, right? But throughout his epistles, he is pointing to Scripture. He's pointing to, uh, if he's not explicitly quoting Scripture, which he does, um, he's definitely uh, alluding to very explicit biblical themes so you know that he has immersed himself in the world of Scripture, um, and, and that's coming out of his heart. So either way, concluding, reading the letters of Ignatius through the lens of Christian formation or virtue formation provi provides a more robust reading of Ignatius and highlights some of the main concerns that come from this martyr bishop. Ignatius's preoccupation with the moral question, that is how Christians should live, is one that I think is of primary importance to this one who is condemned for his witness of the gospel. Concerns of ecclesiology or communion or sacramental theology or all these other things that people want to look at Ignatius and try to, to, to muster up, I think they pale in comparison to understanding that he wanted his readers to become more like Christ. So the, the reflection of Christian moral formation is, is most prevalent with Ignatius. So in light of these things, how should Christians live? That's the question. It is the question that helps readers understand the letters of Ignatius most clearly and reveals how this martyr bishop sought to use his last remaining days to encourage the church of Jesus Christ. So I'd love to just have a, a few minutes of Q&A and then we can move to another topic. Is that okay? Will that work? Are we gonna, are we gonna do that later? Are we gonna try to do that at the end? We have a few questions now, perhaps. Okay. Um, just to say as well, if people 
would rather just write a question down. There is a pad at the back. Okay. Maybe some questions after coffee. That's stuff. right. But so maybe, maybe I'll take two or three questions yeah. now. And if you have other questions, you can write down the pad and we'll do a, a final Q&A at the end. Did the yeah. Get, did you say there were seven epistles? Yeah. Did, obviously, it's getting closer and closer to, on this journey to Rome. Mm. Did they get more urgent? Did they get more refined? Was, was there any transition among, among those? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, yeah, the, the best way to think about that is um, I don't know if there's a standard under, accepted understanding of uh, of which letters came first and which ones came you know, afterwards. But I can say, if you read, especially the, his epistle to the Romans, so he's preparing the Roman church for his arrival, essentially, um, there is kind of an urgency there. And what's interesting is the urgency has to do not with a, uh, I mean, he, he does replicate a lot of these themes, but really it's an understanding of um, don't, try to, don't try to stop this from happening. Uh, not saying that he just was reckless with his life necessarily, but he truly thought that this was God's will for him to, uh, to proclaim the gospel in this way with his life. And so, so there is some urgency there, but it's really tr to try to encourage people. And it's a whole kind of interesting question about, you know, if, he, if people in that church could really ha had the power to release him, then there was probably some very wealthy, higher up Roman type Christians that were in that church. But, uh, but that's another question, so, but yeah, yeah. Did he um, make a distinction between a bishop and an elder, or did he see them as one of those, uh, one quote you made, and the title writes it down, but... Uh, yeah. No, he, he has a distinction, so I think that's, that is a good question to ask. When you read the epistles, you see that he has, again, the, the translation that's going to be the most prevalent is going to be bishop, uh, you know, in our First Timothy 3, we would have overseer, or some older translations still have bishop in there. Episcopos is that word that's there. So he, he envisions those as two offices, but not necessarily of um, one has dominance over the other. So I think the best way to envision this for Ignatius, at least this is how some people have proposed it, is that there is one overseer, and, and the way I like to think about it is there's one lead pastor, and if you're in a church model that has elders, so multiple el elders, maybe that church pastor is, a, is an equal, uh, is a, um, uh, a, a chosen one among the equals, right? So um, for Ignatius, there is a distinction there, but he never says, follow the bishop more than you follow the elders. He's saying, in this way, follow the bishop, as, for instance, he might say, as Christ submitted to the Father, so kind of using that imagery, but then also submit to your elders, and so uh, it, it's not as, it's not as um, hierarchical as some people, I think, want to make it, uh, and some scholars I alluded to, but, um, but he does make a distinction. Yeah. Do you remember yeah, the time he said, um, I'm reading his letters, Bowman, is there a sense in which it's a unique writing uh, in that we understand, you know, the canon of Scripture, but it's almost as if he's merging with the canon of Scripture in the mm -hmm. way he writes. And uh, how do we feel about that? Yeah. Um, well, it, he definitely, well, he does testify to, to knowing Scripture, to having Scripture on his heart. But he also doesn't necessarily, um, I, I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't know what else to say besides it doesn't read like Scripture, right? I mean, he, he's not writing, he recognizes himself as not being an apost apostolic authority, right? He knows that there is a, a Paul who has a certain authority that he didn't, or a Peter, or a John, whoever. Um, so he himself recognizes that. And he says, follow these people as if they were the apostles. So as a way to help encourage that kind of uh, action. So, I mean, I think the best way to think about that is, is this is just an early attestation to post-New Testament Christianity. Uh, he doesn't, he's not quoting Romans at length. He's not quoting 1 Corinthians or Hebrews at length. But there is an explicit understanding that New Testament theology is in his blood. Um, and it, it's not a theological treatise, so you can't read Ignatius and, and try to find justification by faith or something like this. Although I think he believes that. Um, and you can't necessarily find all the components of Trinitarian theology. Although, quite honestly, he has some beautiful imagery about what the Trinity is and, and how it works. Uh, how God works as Trinity. So, so all that being said is kind of going back to my point of I think some people go into Ignatius trying to find some things that aren't there, 
And what I was trying to do is say, well, this is explicitly there. <laughs> I mean, this call to moral uh, formation and Christ-like virtue, uh, which honestly doesn't get talked about very often with, with Ignatius, so, yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, let's move into another, kind of shift gears a little bit, all right? Um, what I want to call this is, is the memory of martyrs, or more specifically, how early Christian preachers used these martyr stories to build Christian character. So give me one second, I'm going to bring up my other uh, document here. So we're going to go a little bit in the future. So we're going to go into the 4th century, uh, up until early 5th century, where uh, Augustine was still living and, and uh, ministering. Uh, and, and we're going to look at three pastors, essentially. We're going to look at Ambrose of Milan. Excuse me. We're going to look at John Chrysostom. So some of these names may sound familiar. If they don't, hopefully you'll get acquainted with them this evening. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to look at uh, Augustine of Hippo. So three kind of giants, really, of the early church uh, and, and how, they, uh, how they preached these stories. Um, and so uh, give me one second as it loads up here. It's taking a little bit of time. Uh, so I think this is helpful for us to understand, maybe starting off with a practical point, is to say that maybe we need to understand that there, there is a place and a purpose for honoring those who came before us in our churches. And I love how we set up the lectures here. I mean, that, that, that kind of understanding of there are those in the faith, uh, whether they gave their life physically or a, a consistent life, a full life of dedication to, to God through service in the church, through uh, a mission effort, or whatever the case may be, I think we have a lot of room to grow in our appreciation for that. And, and, and of course, the pendulum swings to, to the Roman Catholic error, right, of having the, uh, you know, the cult of the saints and praying to saints in a certain way in order to receive certain blessings from them, uh, and, and, a, and a theology of the saints that has gone, uh, gone farther than the Bible allows it to go. But I think we can find maybe a happy medium, right, of saying, okay, that we're not in this uh, praying to the saints for merit, nor should we just completely forget about those who've come uh, before us, uh, but we need to understand that we're standing on the shoulders that have come before us. And what did they say? So this is a way that early Christians did that. <coughs> so, um, yeah, and then after, I think after our session here, we'll just do the questions on the, on the card, and then we can answer all of them at the end there. Uh, so early, so the memory of martyrs. So I want to go back to Justin Martyr. He was a second century uh, f Christian philosopher. And, and in one of his uh, apologies, he wrote two apologies, uh, that is, defenses of the Christian faith. Uh, he describes an early Christian assembly in which the one presiding, that is the, the lead pastor, exhorted hearers to imitate examples of virtue specifically related to the accounts of the prophets and the apostles, very similar to uh, what we read in James. Uh, that is, looking at Old and New Testament scripture. So Justin says this, this is an account that he gives. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one, at one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the president, this is what he calls the leader of the church, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. And that comes from his first apology, chapter 67. So the call to imitate those who have gone before us have, and been faithful to Christ was the warp and woof of ancient Christian exhortation. Just as early Christians sought to imitate biblical figures, preachers of later centuries, would enjoin their hearers to imitate the Christ-like example of the martyrs. So during this time, I, I want to put forth an understanding of these early Christian martyr stories as a way to promote Christian virtue. So we saw that with Ignatius, how he is personally doing that and, and looking back to examples in the New Testament and pointing to examples in the church and saying, they are godly people that you should follow. Likewise, these later preachers are pointing to other martyrs and saying, for that same reason, imitate their faith. So this is, of course, particularly evident in sermonic literature. Specifically, I'm going to be looking at the fourth century, as we mentioned. So the threat of persecution during this time and martyrdom had lulled 
And preachers turn to accounts of martyrs in order to continue this promotion of Christ-like virtue in a world where the danger of spiritual flabbiness, as I like to say, was ever-present. So we think about the fourth century church, right? We think about Constantine giving an official approval of the church and providing funds and, p- and privilege to church leaders in order that the church may no longer not just be persecuted, but would flourish. Uh, he, would, he wouldn't be the one that would officially make Christian the religion of the state. That would be Theodosius later in the fourth century. But at least you saw this happening at the beginning. And what was the result? People in the church started to see that People were flocking to the church because it was the quote-unquote popular thing to do, right? If the emperor is a Christian, I need to be a Christian. So the, the danger of spiritual flabbiness or laziness was creeping into the church. Uh, so I, I want to talk about how these, these preachers reflected on not just martyrs in general, but local martyrs, martyrs that were particularly important to their church within their context in order to connect their congregation to both the temporal and also the cosmic realities of martyrdom and living a life of Christ-like virtue. So in this end, uh, to this end, the reader of Christian sermonic li- literature must heed the warning of, this, of a certain scholar who says, one should approach every aspect of this complex field with care. Um, so a, a modern scholar named Candida Moss notes that the similarities in martyr traditions uh, have influenced Christian martyr stories. Indeed, she sees the influence of older martyr traditions on Jesus' passion itself. And this is what she says. She says, The problem is that as we have received it in the Gospel of Luke or another Gospel, the model embodied by Jesus was itself partly based on other non-Christian examples. This means that every time someone is referred to or described as dying like Christ, they are actually dying like Socrates or the Maccabean martyrs from the uh, Jewish tradition. I, of course, don't agree with this, but you can see what people are saying in modern times about these, modern, uh, about these martyr stories. Uh, they're, they're saying it's, they're, just, they're tapping into this other historical, like if you know anything about the death of Socrates where he was given the hemlock and he drank it, uh, and, and it was kind of this noble death. Um, people today are saying martyr stories are just taking that kind of uh, image and, and impl- uh, applying it to these martyrs. I don't think that's true. I think there's something else going on there. And I think you can make establishments, you can make surface level connections to a lot of different things, but you have to look at what's on the foundation. What are the presuppositions going on here? And as we mentioned with Ignatius, these martyrs are told, the stories are told because they are dying like Christ. They are committed to Christ. They're committed to a a life and to a confession of faith. Let your yes be your yes. I think that's a very important verse for understanding martyrdom. So when someone comes to someone and asks them to confess Christ uh, and and offer a sacrifice to the emperor as it was done in in the early centuries— uh, they would, if they were true to their faith, they would say, yes, I am a Christian, and no, I'm not going to sacrifice to the elder, uh, to the emperor. Uh, sometimes they would just be let go and just, you know, be punished in some way, but a lot of times those would end in death because of their, their obstinacy, and from, their, from the Roman perspective, their obstinacy in not confessing uh, just that, that, em- that the emperor was a god and you could sacrifice to him. Uh, so all that being said, Christians had a very specific understanding of what it meant to die for Christ. Uh, There's a very specific purpose, namely, for later in the fourth century, to bring about virtue in Christians listening to these stories and to relate such virtue ultimately back to the passion of Christ. Christians relating to the stories of martyrs were relating back to a specific event for a specific purpose, to provide a model to imitate in Christian discipleship. So martyr accounts provided a template for imitation. So as you think about those who came before us, that it provides a template for imitation, not uh, recognizing that their life was perfect, right, but in the things that they did unto the Lord, they can be a template in which we can imitate as well and be encouraged by those things. Uh, so martyr accounts provide this template, a template that is modeled on Christ whose salvific death and resurrection made such martyr deaths meaningful. If 
Christ wasn't, if Christ didn't die and was resurrected, there was no reason to die for him, to die for that faith. Um, that, that's that's um, something that scholars, modern scholars often don't consider, I think. So early Christians drew these parallels to the dying in the manner of Jesus Christ. As we mentioned with Ignatius, he does this. Others in early Christian writings do this as well. Uh, a, disciple who was, who, a disciple of Christ is one who followed in the way of Christ. And for some, not everybody, for some, this included death. The, thr- the thrust of this account, however, was not to imply that martyrdom was the only way of Christian living. So it's very important for us to understand. I think this is a myth that sometimes gets promoted in the churches is that for the first three or 400 years of the, of the church's history, there was just, everyone was just being martyred and persecuted. Um, the, the reality is those were sp- uh, spontaneous and, and not always sequential. So they could go years without being an uprising or, or a, a persecution uh, of the church. But when it happened, it was significant. And, and I heard someone describe it this way, is that, okay, you may have only had one person in your, di- in your church die in that first 300 years, but if one person in your church is, is condemned to die for their faith, that leaves a mark on your church, even if it's just one person. It didn't have to be droves of people being marched off to the amphitheater to receive death. It could have just been one person that marked your community and allowed you to understand the significance of dying for Christ. Um, so I think we need to understand that when we think about early church persecution, that it wasn't everywhere all the time, but when it did happen, it was a serious affair. Um, so let's move on to, to Ambrose. Ambrose of Milan. Uh, he's often painted as a figure who is just this political bishop who's just trying to rub shoulders with emperors and, and get his way in various theological confrontations. And, and I think he was confrontational in some ways, maybe more than I'm comfortable with, uh, but he was a fallen human being, as we all are, so, but what I want to point out is the fact that he was primarily a preacher and a pastor in his church there in Milan. So specifically, I want to look at uh, a letter that he writes, which basically replicates a sermon that he preached about two uh, martyred saints in Milan. First one was Gervasius, that's G E R. V-A-S-I-U-S, Gervasius, and Protasius, P-R-O-T-A-S-I-U-S. So these two brother martyrs in Milan. Uh, So Ambrose of Milan is easily described as a significant preacher of the fourth century. Apart from the testimony that we have from Augustine, so if you've read anything about Augustine and his confessions, you see that it was Ambrose and his ability to open up the Old Testament meaning to Augustine that ultimately allowed him to come to faith. Uh, it was, the, the, the final marker was him reading Paul in Romans, but still, uh, the preaching of Ambrose allowed Augustine to go down the road to become a Christian. Uh, so that's significant. Uh, but Ambrose's biographer, his early biographer in the fourth century, attests to not only his rhetorical skills, so his, his ability to communicate, but also his pastoral work within the Church of Milan. As preacher, Ambrose illuminated the scriptures for his hearers on a daily basis. So think about that. Daily, Ambrose was preaching the word in his church. Daily was he opening up the scriptures as people would come in and out and had recognized times of hearing the word. This was a daily occurrence for Ambrose. Uh, so, so Ambrose, <coughs> excuse me, Augustine attests to the fact that only through the preaching of Ambrose did he begin to understand the scriptures. Uh, So recent scholars have noticed just ethical concerns within Ambrose, uh, but not a lot of them are really thinking about how he relates this to martyrdom stories. So that's what I want to kind of focus on here. Uh, Specifically, in his letter to his sister, Marcelina, he recounted the discovery of the remains of the martyrs Gervasius and Protasius. The bodies of these brother martyrs, beheaded for Christ, likely in the late second century, uh, were lost to the church prior to this supposedly miraculous discovery. Uh, Ambrose embraced this discovery as an opportunity to implore imitation for the purpose of building Christ-like virtue, significantly, sorry, specifically in light of ongoing battles with 
the Arians. So Arians affirmed a different kind of Christology, a different understanding of who Jesus was. It was not a scriptural understanding. He was a created being according to, according to the Arians. And in Milan, where Ambrose is preaching, there's a heavy uh, Arian uh, influence there. And so he's combating this influence theologically. And so he sees this as an opportunity, pastorally, I think, to seize upon this in order to promote true Christian virtue uh, related to sound doctrine, essentially. Uh, so <clears throat> Ambrose proceeds to give an account of this sermon that he preached on this occasion. So Ambrose describes the acts of these martyrs, and he says this, For not worldly enticements, but the grace of the divine working, raise them to the firmament of the most sacred passion. And they long, and long before their testimony of the character and virtues bore witness of them, that they continued steadfast against the dangers of this world. So you can just imagine him preaching this to his church. And he's saying they were elevated to the point where they were able to mimic the passion of Christ. They were given that gift, if you will, of, of becoming Christ-like in their death, essentially. Uh, and then pointing to the fact that they had a, a certain character and virtue because of that. So this was not a death, or sorry, theirs was a death like that of Jesus Christ. Their death demonstrates not only likeness to God, but a renunciation of the various, quote, dangers of this world. Ambrose presents their witness as, quote, true day and full of life and eternal brightness in contrast to the darkness of the world. It was this, quote, constancy in confession and perseverance in their witness which was to be commended. So for Ambrose, in his immediate context, the constancy of confessing Christ as both God and man was primary in contrast to these Aryan groups, these, these uh, alternate Christological groups that were there around him. So later in his sermon, Ambrose will contrast the beliefs and assertions of Arians in this context with the confession of these Milanese martyrs. So again, going back to this idea of if you truly believe that Christ was of this kind, that he was truly God and truly man, and he truly did these things for our salvation, and only he could do this, then it's only him who is worthy to give your life as a testimony. If you're an Arian, if you're someone who doesn't affirm the, the true divinity and humanity of Jesus Christ, then why would you want to die for that? That's kind of the idea that he's trying to portray here. So for Ambrose, the message is clear. These martyrs are to give his audience courage in the face of current trials. He declares, whom are we to esteem as the princes of the people but the holy martyrs, amongst whose number Protasius and Gervasius, long unknown, are now enrolled, who have caused the church of Milan, barren of martyrs until now, now as the mother of many children, to rejoice in the distinctions and the instances of her own sufferings. So these martyrs provide encouragement for current sufferings. So that's a, I think that's a helpful word for us to understand and remember today, is that even today, those who are being martyred for the faith should be an encouragement to us in our current sufferings. So if we think about it, the sufferings which other brothers and sisters may uh, uh, experience that lead to death uh, should put a perspective on the current sufferings that we have, some of, uh, which likely none of us will have to uh, face as far as confessing our faith in order uh, so that we, that we may give our life for Christ. So that's just a perspective we need to keep in mind. Um, so these martyrs provide encouragement for current sufferings. The implication for Ambrose's audience is simple. Imitate the perseverance of those who came before. A very helpful word for us. Ambrose confirms that many healings were actually attributed to the discovery of these martyr bodies. These martyrs represent a renewed time of miracles, similar to that of Jesus Christ back on earth. And we don't have time to go into what was actually happening here, but everything that he's alluding to is something that has to do with what Jesus Christ did in the flesh. And, be, and he did that because he was the Son of God. So healings, and, 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 and uh, specifically he points to someone who was uh, supposedly cured of their blindness uh, at the discovery of the martyrs. Uh, so that's a whole messy issue I'm not going to get into, but uh, uh, Ambrose talks about it. So <laughs> Um, the discovery of martyrs coincides with this great need within the church, according to Ambrose. So he alludes to this, uh, to a recent affliction with both the Arians and the Empress Justina. 
Uh, Ambrose interprets this recent discovery as God's blessing of protection against these false believers. These holy soldiers who serve to protect the church, quote, are able to defend but desire not to attack. In contrast to those who were around him, the Empress Justina in the, in the late fourth century was trying to procure church buildings for Aryan use uh, so that they could, they could both be uh, Orthodox, uh, Nicene, if you know the word Council of Nicaea, Nicaea, and then also the Aryan Christian. So she was trying to make it work out for both, and Ambrose obviously had a problem with this. And so uh, he's pointing out the fact that they're actually attacking them because of this. They're actually physically, and, there, and there's instances where there was violence put upon the church because of this desire to establish a, an Aryan church as well. So, so he's drawing out this implication. So these are not soldiers in the worldly sense, but are, quote, soldiers of Christ. This protection Ambrose attributes solely to the Lord, quoting Psalm 27 through 8. Ambrose makes an explicit contrast. There are those who serve the world, and there are those who serve Christ. Their purity of commitment was made evident through the purifying fire of martyrdom. Ambrose exhorts his hearers to be like these champions, that is, those who, quote, are able to defend, but again, desire not to attack. Ambrose compares the unbelief of the Arians to the unbelief of the Jews. The comparison is simply a textual juxtaposition, so he's trying to say this is what the Jews were like in the Gospels as Jesus interacted with them. Jewish leaders in the Gospels represented those who were opposed to the Gospel and the miracles of Christ. Ambrose implies the same thing with the Arians. By contrasting the two groups, Ambrose implicitly implores his hearers to imbibe the faith of the martyrs rather than the unbelief of the Arians. And you can imagine a pastor who has a church down the road who is preaching false doctrine and trying to pastorally uh, come alongside his people and shepherd them well in order that they would not fall into that error. So using this example to help encourage his, uh, his church to do that, uh, it was very important for Ambrose. Uh, so, belief in the testimony of the martyrs and the supposed miracles surrounding the discovery becomes a litmus test for true faith. Just as the Jews denied the Son of God, surrounding Arians around him denied the legitimacy of these martyrs' confession and the subsequent reception into the church. So, there's much more we can say here, but suffice it to say that Ambrose viewed these martyrs as true confessors of Christ, apart from the Arians who were unbelievers. So it goes back to this idea of two ways, right? There's one that leads to life. There's one that leads to death. He's drawing a contrast here. So those who wish to follow Christ will take note of the lives of these two martyrs and imitate their faith. So moving on to another fourth century pastor preacher. Yes, yes, sir. Can we take a break? Oh, yeah. Is that all right? Let's do a break. And then we can... Um, yeah, let's do that. We'll come back on. So we'll just have some tea, coffee for maybe a quarter of an hour, and then... Okay, that's great. Well, thanks again for indulging me. And uh, yeah. as we wrap up, uh, as we wrap this up, I hope you guys are learning uh, just a, a small piece of something. And if you do, and you walk away, and then I feel like that's, you know, then the purpose has been served. So... Um, and again, we'll, we'll have a little bit of Q&A time, Q time afterwards. But um, So uh, we just talked about Ambrose, right? We just talked about how he uh, talked, uh, discovered these two saints and how they helped him understand this issue going on in their church. So again, the whole thing I'm trying to bring out here is that there is a, a contextual, uh, local understanding of, of martyr stories for these early preachers. And the next one that we're going to look at is, is John Chrysostom. And actually, he's going to preach on Ignatius of Antioch. So, uh, for John Chrysostom, if you know anything about John Chrysostom, he's one of the most prevalent preachers and pastors of the early church. Uh, there's so many works on him, and it's, it's, it's astounding, actually. I don't, I don't know one person that can read them all. There's so many. Um, but this example, I think, is very helpful for us because he's going to look at Ignatius of Antioch as an example to put forth before his people. And he's going to do it in a very specific way. I think it's really interesting. Uh, this example is a sermon from Ignatius of Antioch, and, and, and something that, that, you might, uh, that might be helpful to understand is that he preached a lot of sermons on martyrs. Uh, but because we're talking about Ignatius of Antioch previously, I thought it'd be interesting to, to talk about this one. Uh, and it's representative of kind of the rest of his sermons on martyrs. So um, 
So reflecting on the life of Ignatius, Chrysostom begins with a comparison of Roman conventions of entertaining guests at dinner. So they wish to, quote, display their own wealth and show goodwill to their acquaintances. Likewise, for Chrysostom, the spirit sits, uh, s- before, sets before rather the, the Christian community, quote, the table of the martyrs. So he's using this imagery in this, his martyr story that he's retelling of Ignatius, and, and God is setting forth the table of the martyrs, like an entertainer of displaying the wealth that he has. And, and what he's trying to say here is that the martyrs are the wealth of the church that God is displaying before us. Uh, So he speaks of a table, he speaks of a crown, he speaks of a prize awarded to these martyrs. And such an image uh, goes back to this Roman concept of games, of of maybe barbarian games or uh, gladiator games rather, instituted by wealthy benefactors. Such games were often held in honor uh, for various rulers or for the entertainment of the patron himself. Men were the traditional participants in these, quote, heathen games, is what Chrysostom says, since their task was primarily bodily. But here's what what Chrysostom says. He contrasts that with the image of of the martyrs. Since the martyr task was primarily dealing with the soul or, or a spiritual issue, such a contest was opened up for both male and female. For each kind, he says, the theater is arranged. So what Chrysostom is trying to do here, what he's trying to implore his readers to understand is that discipleship, this Christian view of discipleship is open for all people, not just uh, males participating in this glorious game that he's relating to the Romans, but it's for all people. So this theater of martyrdom contains many who are, quote, proclaimed conquerors and are crowned in order that you may learn the means of their exploits themselves, that in Christ Jesus there is no hindrance to those who run in the course of religion. So I think he has Galatians 3.28 in mind here, uh, and he demonstrates that all are one in Christ, and therefore all are capable of attaining to Christian discipleship. The example of the martyrs demonstrates this. Martyrs are young, they're old, they're male, they're female. Uh, Roman entertainments were bodily representations for Chrysostom of the cosmic theater of martyrdom, what's going on in the heavenlies, the the spiritual reality of confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and and dying on his behalf. So, excuse me, the Bishop of Antioch uh, reflects uh, on this previous bishop uh, particularly in his, the, uh, the episcopal duties, the, the priestly duties that he expounded on. So he says this, For see, he presided over the church among us nobly and with such carefulness as Christ desires. For that which Christ declared to be the highest standard and rule of the episcopal office did this man display by his deeds. For having heard Christ saying, the good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep, and all courage, and with all courage, he did lay it down for those under his care. So Chrysostom is, is specifically pe- speaking to the, the pastoral role of what Ignatius was doing, um, and, and, and drawing out those things. So the virtue of Ignatius' offices are reflective in what he says are the different colors of virtue. Uh, which the Apostle Paul painted in the features of the office of bishop, particularly looking at 1 Timothy 3, in order that each of these who mount to that dignity, he says, looking thereupon, may administer their own affairs with just such strictness. So uh, what I'm thinking here is, is when he's preaching this sermon, he's drawing out the implications of who Ignatius was as a pastor, likely in my opinion, his audience is someone who uh, is maybe a, a gathering of church leaders or a gathering of those who needed to be encouraged in church leadership uh, and, and church ministry. Because his whole sermon, so again, thinking about why these preachers were contextually in their church focusing on these people for specific issues, for him, it's, in, in my opinion, he's looking at this in order to encourage greater church leadership because his entire sermon is about the example of Ignatius as someone who led well, who, who disposed, uh, dispensed rather, the duties of his office well. So that's how, that's how I'm taking this. Uh, so he implores his readers, Chrysostom does, to have a sound judgment of mind, imitating Ignatius in the management of their business and their life. 
So this practical imitation of the martyr's life is most readily applied to those who wish to take up leadership in the church, as I mentioned. He says this, For if the oversight of the church now furnishes much weariness and work to those who govern it, consider how double and triple and manifold was the work then when there were dangers and fightings and snares and fear continually. So he's basically saying, you guys have it easy <laughs> compared to what Ignatius had to deal with in the early second century with all these dangers. So the office of the overseer indeed is a high calling. And if those who lead consider those who have gone before them, then they will consider their examples worthy of imitation. So now just two simple observations from this and we'll move forward. So the bulk of the sermon, again, focuses on Ignatius as bishop. Uh, so while readers, we can't know for certain, again, I'm going to emphasize this, it appears that his audience may have been church leaders, so maybe a gathering or kind of a small council of church leaders, but he's, he's the one preaching the sermon. Um, he needs to, maybe he needs to promote the purity of church leadership that, uh, in order to uh, encourage these, these gathered leaders. So apart from this conjecture, the reason is, uh, for focusing on Ignatius as the bishop is unclear. But, I think, with this in mind, Chrysostom does provide a general exhortation towards imitation. He says this, Not only today, therefore, but every day, let us go forth to him, plucking spiritual fruits from him. For it is, it is possible for him who comes hither f with faith to gather the fruit of many good things. So basically, uh, Chrysostom is trying to say here, uh, look at the total life of Ignatius and go to him as if you're going to pick fruit from his branches, spiritual fruit. Uh, and, and that's the, the driving concern uh, for Chrysostom. Uh, so that was a brief look at that. And let's go into Augustine and we'll, and we'll conclude with this, this part of the presentation. Uh, Augustine, so the mighty church history, the mighty doctor of the faith, uh, pillar of church history, he, he preaches two sermons on, perhaps some of you have read the account of Perpetua and Felicity, these two female martyrs in North Africa. Uh, so Augustine himself is a pastor, he's a preacher in North Africa. So these stories of Perpetua and Felicity martyred around two, 203 A.D., um, are important for Augustine, and they're important for his context. Remember what I said earlier, if, if just one person dies for their faith in your church, it's significant, and it rings throughout the history of that church uh, for generations, and, and that's the case here, I think. So this sermon indicates that the passion, that is the full story of their martyrdom, was likely read aloud in the church. So as part of a, a, a time of reflection and, and drawing upon this story for character formation, uh, they read the account in the church. Uh, and it seems from what some scholars say to be, this was a very unique instance. Not every church was doing this, but because this story so impacted the local church, it was kind of part of their, not every time they gathered, but a, a specific time throughout the year, it looks like, they would read this, and, and Augustine would have a sermon on this and draw out some implications from it. Uh, so, <clears throat> in numerous places, he notes this peculiar understanding of focusing just on females as martyrs in the story. Because actually there were men, Christian men in there as well. But what, so what's he trying to say? He's trying to say that the Christian faith can look to female heroes. It doesn't exclude female heroes in understanding the, the call of discipleship. Uh, so we again, going back to what Chrysostom says, it's not just male or female or old or young. The call of discipleship is for all. And so Augustine really focuses in on this. It's really important for him and his hearers to understand that, um, that there is an account of two women who were faithful, in, and honestly in ways that he talks about that, that men weren't faithful, that some men backed away from. But these women, by the strength of the Holy Spirit, were able to give a testimony of their faith, which led to death. Uh, so, so he begins with triumphant language relating the acts of Perpetua and Felicity. Perpetua was a uh, upper class Roman. Uh, Felicity was her servant or slave that they were both of the faith. Both um, went to be martyred at the same time. They were likely both arrested in the, in the household there. 
Uh, so from the beginning of the sermon, Augustine admits to the inadequacy of his sermon efforts compared to the act of martyrdom. So his sermon isn't anywhere near in strength and veracity of the actual martyrdom account. The martyrdom speaks for itself, but he's still trying to draw those things out. He says, what, after all, could be more glorious than these women, whom men can more easily admire than imitate? So he's kind of calling men to the floor. He's saying, uh, you, you, you think you can imitate these women. I, you know, I, I dare you, you know, kind of like that. Uh, that's, that's your call. So while extolling the virtues of the, these martyrs, Augustine credits such actions to God and a faithful zeal, he says. So from the beginning, <clears throat> though he enthusiastically praises these martyr acts, he does not separate them from the work of God and the direction of their faith being a primary motivation. So throughout this text, uh, there is, there is uh, this idea of, um, uh, again, of women being able to, pr- uh, to prove themselves disciples of Jesus Christ through martyrdom. Um, what can we draw from that? I don't think there's anything quite conclusive we can say about that, but I think in general, as I mentioned, it's easy, uh, it's easy for us to neglect. Um, maybe we can, we can build up pastors and other leaders who have gone before us, and we should do that. But, but what about women in the churches that have gone before us and, and done faithful acts, uh, whether like Perpetua, who have who've died for their faith, or who have who've lived a life of godliness that is worthy of imitation, that we can draw out and put before our churches and say, this is someone you can follow. Um, and Perpetua and Felicity were, were young women, uh, very young, in their probably their early 20s. So uh, to put forth a... Uh, an example like this is, is, a, is, is a big deal, I think. So, uh, his, I think ultimately, we can't understand why this is a focus, if there's an, a reason he's drawing out besides just it's a discipleship is for all people. Uh, I think his ultimate goal is to focus on their deeds for the purpose of relating their faith to all, again, both men and women. These acts performed by females are worthy of imitation for all. Uh, though some could read Augustine's statement as either neglecting the importance of their gender or being too fluid in his language, I think his point is twofold. I think he says Christian female martyrs are heroes, and gender is not the primary concern for consideration. It's their faith, at the acts of faith that they put forward. Uh, so Augustine, he proceeds to depict the story of martyrdom in terms of good versus evil. So again, this cosmic understanding that Chrysostom talks about, where these things may be happening in temporal realms, like in, in a, um, a, a gladiatorial game, but it's, it's really an image of what's going on in the heavens, right? There's a war going on in the spiritual uh, heavenlies. And so he depicts this as well, Augustine says. Uh, he calls, the theater of cruelty was filled with a throng of people to see them killed, going back to the actual historical instance. In contrast to this, though, Christians now fill the theater of the church to recognize their piety and show them honor. So before, Romans and those in the arena wanted to despise them, wanted to see them killed. Now Christians in the arena of the church are building them up, showing them honor uh, by uh, recognizing their faithfulness. Uh, So each year, Christians reenact these acts of the martyrs, yet not, quote, an ungodliness committed on one day in an act of sacrilege, pointing back to that original instance. uh, There's a different attitude here. The the original audience, quote, saw with the eyes of the flesh sights which were to glut the monstrous humanity of their hearts. But we behold with the eyes of the heart sights which they were not permitted to see, so they just saw two women who were blaspheming uh, the Roman government or the Roman emperor. We see two women who were uh, committed to the faith of Jesus Christ and ever-present, steadfast, persevering in the midst of persecution. That's what he's trying to say there. This forceful language illustrates this dichotomy with which martyrdoms were interpreted. Augustine affirms that for Christians, martyrdoms were pious acts in service to God. For non-Christians, they were simply participants in blood sport. The original shouts of, quote, abuse and mockery have now been transformed to shouts of admiration and joy with the celebration of the church. So Augustine's language here is significant for virtue formation, going back to this idea of Christian character. By illustrating this contrast, 
Augustine places his audience in one group compared to the other, right? So this idea has been consistent throughout the night. As hearers discern Augustine's message, they are implicitly implored to acknowledge their moral position within the faithful. So as Augustine's talking about these things, he's saying these, these shouts of blood sport and versus these shouts of joint acclamation, the, the, the audience interprets that and says, I am a part of those who have that are shouting for joy versus those who are shouting uh, uh, monstrous things, he would say. So he's using that in a sermon kind of language. He's drawing his people in. So I think that's a good reminder for those who preach sermons to, to draw people in. It's okay to use images and, uh, and stories to draw people in in order to get them to think about things, like using a tea kettle, right, to get people to think about things. Uh, which I've not stopped thinking about all day. So <laughs> um, and this is what Augustine's doing. So, uh, r- so regardless of one's ability, Christians should imitate the actions, emotions, and spiritual vigor of the martyrs. Being members of the same body as Perpetua and Felicity, Augustine's audience had spiritual access to the other members of the body. We too have spiritual access to reflect on those who came before us. They saw what other members accomplished and they could therefore imitate them. Augustine said this to his his congregation. Just as that one man laid down his life for us all, so the martyrs too imitated him and laid down their lives for their brothers and sisters. So it's just some brief observations before we conclude. Um, First, uh, uh, sorry, Augustine implores all Christians, both men and women, to follow the example of these female martyrs. Uh, And that's significant, I think. Spiritual warfare does not view one's gender as the primary concern, but one's commitment to faith. So second, Augustine draws upon his audience's imagination for the the purpose of uh, of imitation. Uh, They are called upon to imagine the original context of this Roman blood sport and contrast that with the glory of winning the heavenly prize. Uh, such an image was called upon to aid in the act of imitation. And it's a scriptural image as well if we read Revelation and other places. Finally, Augustine's consideration of these Christian witnesses was a regular event in the life of the church. Uh, it looks as if they did this yearly at the same time. The call to imitate was a lifelong endeavor. They didn't just preach the one sermon and call it done they continually had to go back to this. And there's at least three sermons that Augustine preached on Perpetua and Felicity, and they have a similar tone, but they're a little bit different in nature and and description. So he's consistently doing that. Uh, Augustine, in his role as preacher, continually employed his congregation towards Christ-like virtue, and this occasion provided a yearly reminder for two individuals who came to be followed in the direction of that goal. So, uh, thinking about modern context. I mean, what are ways that we can further promote people who came before us in our churches, in, in, our, in our immediate ministry context? Uh, is there ways that we can honor those who've come before us? And, um, you know, as some do, write, write articles, write stories, write things that we can portray and, and pass down to those who, came, who come after us of this is your history, this is your legacy. These are people that walked among us in this room who portrayed Christian faith, Christian virtue, uh, and some gave their lives for that. Uh, so just a, a contemporary application to think about. So to conclude this, <clears throat> I think understanding how preachers in the fourth century related martyr stories to their congregation sheds significant light on the purpose of such stories. Specifically, preachers focused on martyrs as examples of Christ-like virtue, Their examples, as preached by the likes of Ambrose, Chrysostom, uh, Augustine, had a temporal connection to the congregation. That is, these saints once walked here. So, um, what about the congregants now? What can they do? They can understand that they have done these things that came before them, and now I can follow the example of those who, uh, who preceded me. There's an earthly connection point on this heavenly journey of pursuing Christian piety. So furthermore, preachers implored hearers towards this cosmic vision. This isn't just something that happens here on earth. This is a reality, spiritually, that is happening in the heavenlies. Uh, 
they, uh, uh, furthermore, they, they see this and they uh, attend to this theater of the martyrs in which Christ-like virtue was the ultimate direction. Remembering martyrs serves to bolster the Christian life, providing a tangible way to grasp Christian living. As martyrs envision life with Christ, preachers can call upon hearers to rehearse such a life based on the performers who came before. So, any questions about this? Any, any things that I can help highlight or understand about how preachers preached about martyrs? Yeah. Are they calling their congregation to, you're not being persecuted, you're not being chased and being killed, and you don't fear commitment? Yeah. Um, or is that the margin of the level of age? Or, or are they any, like, in other words, would they honor the ones who are still living? Um, yeah. Uh, because you, have, you haven't been killed here. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I, think I understand that. what you're saying. Yeah, so. Uh, would they say that just because someone is not dying for their faith, they're not fully living the Christian life? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and, and part of that, especially with this conversation, is because reality was just, that was not the case. I mean, you're, I mean you could still be in some areas where people could I mean, conceivably kill you because of, of being a Christian, but as far as a Roman government goes, it's not an issue anymore. And so, and so I think that the purpose of this is, right, is to, is to draw out the spiritual implications of what the martyrs are doing and to commit your life in that same way, right? So, um, it, yeah, yeah. And even Ignatius himself, he never implores people and never says that uh, martyrdom is the way to Christian discipleship. It's the way that God has chosen him to do that. And I think that's, that's how the early church perceived martyrdom. It wasn't a, well, I have to jump out in the middle of the crowd and say I'm a Christian too, and therefore I can become a you know, better Christian. It's uh, if your faith is made known by your acts or just your reputation in the community, and you are called out because of that, then your, your perseverance is demonstrated in the fact that you are continually committing to the faith, and which could lead to death. Yeah. But never like a you, unless you die for Christ, you're not a true believer. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, yes, sir. Uh, as Paul says, follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. Mm -hmm. And just on, 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 the, on the theme of martyrs tonight, um, I was brought up with a Roman Catholic background as well myself. Mm -hmm. And the danger was in following man when we think of martyrs. Mm -hmm. And as we know, they were known as saints within the church. They led saintly lives. So we're kind of drawn to pray to them as well. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 that danger in us as well, isn't it? Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I think that's, I think the image I kind of portrayed at the beginning was kind of the pendulum swing of, you know, you can see martyrs and therefore you see them as uh, a higher level of saints that therefore can dispense Christ's virtue through your prayers to them. Uh, and then you can have the other side, which says, well, we don't need to talk about them. We just need to talk about, you know, what Jesus did, which is, of course, true. What I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't neglect the testimony of those who come before us. And, and the early church didn't do that. I would, I don't think, I think it was a much later development that, th that Christians at the church saw martyrs as, as this idea that we see in Roman Catholic theology today. I think even in this time, they're seeing martyrs as examples to follow because they followed Christ. And that's never separated in the discussion. So it's always these folks display a faith that is uh, ultimately uh, uh, influenced or, or informed by their commitment to Christ. Uh, and so that's what is going to be the, it's gonna be the ultimate thing. But let's still reflect on what they did and allow you to connect with that in a certain way. And I know for, for me, and maybe some of you, you read biographies of Christians and things like this, and that's, it's kind of a similar idea of uh, those who, who did missionary efforts and things like this. Well, what can we learn from them, right? I mean, we have to, run, we have to understand they weren't perfect. You know, they were sinful human beings. Um, but they had a life which can be imitated and we can learn from. But you're right, that is the danger, and we, we need to be careful.
not to honor man so too much to the neglect of honoring uh, God who is, who is the ultimate, yeah. Good. Yeah, any other questions? <clears throat> I can tell you my favorite color or Yeah. Mm. Is, um, is, that, is that Ignatius? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's multiple images. Every time Ignatius is portrayed in art, um, it's always two lions surrounded him. So this is kind of a more Renaissance rendering. Um, but yeah, um, that's always the case. So, and, and especially with like martyr art and things like this, there's always going to be some kind of. I say always, it, it, se- it tends to be more of a, in the artistic representation, something that had to do with their martyrdom, like an image that had to do, so with him, he's being fed to, to the to wild lions, beasts that he talks about. To others, it may be a, another symbolic image of their martyrdom, so yeah. Yeah, Johnny. Uh, when you talked about Ignatius and uh, the goal of virtue, but it didn't happen in, <coughs> in isolation, but within the context of the church yeah. and submission to the leaders. Um, what did that look like, or how did he flesh that out? Because I guess that could be open to authoritarianism and yeah. abuse in that kind of way. Sure. Yeah, and I think that is a danger. Uh, I don't think Ignatius affirms that. And I think ultimately, uh, so the, the danger is with Ignatius, he says a lot of things that he doesn't go into detail about, but I think we can discern the fact that. When he says, follow the bishop as Christ followed the Father, there's an act there, right, that is displayed in, in you submitting to your, your lead pastor, the, the instruction of your lead pastor, the, the, um, the spiritual wisdom of your lead pastor. Um, he never deals with a situation where your lead pastor is, goes off the deep end or something like this. Uh, he, de- he does deal with those who are false teachers and, and those who are promoting a of faith or doctrine that is not Christian, so presumably he, he would have that kind of idea in mind. Um, but I think how he avoids the authoritarian piece is that he, he lays out all the church offices, even, even deacons, uh, and, and, and he continually talks about a mutual submission. So the, I mean, there is a role given to church leaders, mainly overseer, elders, deacons. There are God-given roles that God equips those, those people for. But um, there is an understanding that there's a, there's a self, I mean, a, a, a mutual submission within the whole leadership of the church. And but, but I think another important thing is for Ignatius to understand is that uh, in a time of persecution, uh, th- there needs to be a focal point. You know, there needs to be um, a leader uh, identified in, in, o- in order to help shepherd the people through that. And so I think that's part of his motivation as well is to identify these, these leaders and say, follow them, uh, and, and implicitly underneath that, because you know what the times are like. You know what's going on. So unity is a big theme. Uh, submission to church leadership. Uh, and I think he would affirm that he's not, uh, it's not gonna be an authoritarian type understanding. But that's a good question to think about, yeah. Yes, yeah. Predecessors in the church, uh, without it sounding like the pastor's preaching on uh, grace free works, as mm-hmm. opposed to. It's a good question. Yeah, again, okay, another slippery slope that can that can uh, come up if you're not careful. What I would say, and just practically speaking, um, is if <clears throat> you're in a position where you're going to preach, uh, I mean, you're always going to have the text primary. Uh, and even in Augustine, it, this is not separated from the preaching of the word. This is in addition to the preaching of the word. So, uh, and these pastors are preaching on a daily basis, um, multiple times a day even. So, um, so all that being said, as, as a practical thing that I could think through and think about is, you know, how can I tie an example of somebody, not in every sermon, but in a, in a relevant way, an example of someone that relates to this passage in some way, uh, or as, as, a, as a separate piece in the church uh, life and worship, maybe not on a Sunday morning, right, but maybe, maybe as a pastor you're going to produce a, uh, a blog post or a, something that you can uh, 
think through and, and demonstrate to your people and, and maybe give a series on 20th century missionaries who have died for the faith. Uh, stories, right, that help us understand this is what it means to live the Christian life. Um, obviously, we are going to have scripture as our foundation, but I mean, we, we need to continually remind ourselves of what it means to be the Christian life and put these stories in front of us as believers um, and, and even think about replacing these stories with stories that are not Christian in character. So, so just thinking about how to incorporate that, I mean, um, I, would never, I would never say this is, the, this is the, the main content of the sermon, right? I don't think that's, that, that shouldn't be the case. Um, but I think you can bring it in as needed, as an illustration, or maybe as an application point, um, or in another way, as I suggested, or, or be creative in other ways. Yeah. And then, so, and then to not um, focus on their works, I mean, I think this goes back to what's the, the crux of these stories. I mean, the crux of the stories is always uh, the, the, the zeal of their faith, which is not separated by um, uh, an understanding that God is driving them, that the Holy Spirit is empowering them. So it's not of themselves, but they are acting. So they are, uh, they're, not, they're not denying Christ. They're consciously understanding what it means to be a Christian, which does, and I think I mentioned earlier, which does come with action. Um, you know, even Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, I mean, so that we would set aside for these good works. God did these things. God did it so that we would be able to, to do the things that he set aside for us to do. So, I don't know if that helps, but, yeah. Um, yes? I've, I've been here um, to appreciate the, all of the martyrs you went through, um, and a lack, in many ways, of understanding that they went through. Has that been part of the thing that's contributed to the prosperity theology and uh, the fact that um, Christians shouldn't ever go through difficulty. Mm. You know, it's a practical question, you know, yeah. are we affected because of our lack of understanding that the church is one? Yeah. Those who have gone before and those of us who follow in footsteps. Yeah, I think that's a helpful observation. I mean, I would say, you know, prosperity theology I mean, you, you can go to the Passion of Christ and, and the example of Paul in Scripture and say, you know, this I mean, New Testament theology denies the reality of prosperity gospel. And then on top of that, you can say, and also look at these people who consistently lived a life of Christ-likeness. I, I don't see prosperity in that worldly sense, right? I mean, you see Augustine and other people talking about a heavenly prosperity, right? The crowns that you know, Revelation talks about uh, those who have died uh, for the name of Jesus. So, yeah, but I think you're right. That is a helpful corrective um, uh, on top of, you know, good New Testament theology. Yeah, that's a good insight. Anything else? Well, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much for letting me hang out with you guys, and uh, I may be seeing some of you the rest of the week, and if I don't get to see you, yeah, Joy. Some books coming, and I'm sorry it's tomorrow and not before tonight mm -hmm. um, that Paul has recommended. Mm -hmm. So, can I just name them and you can just say a, a sentence? Absolutely, it'd be great. If yep. anyone's interested, come back to me because I will have them here tomorrow. The first one is Haken, Rediscovering the Church Fathers. Yeah. So, Michael Haken, uh, who's my doctoral supervisor, wrote a very accessible. Uh, introduction uh, or reintroduction to the church fathers. Uh, he kind of gives a, um, I think six or seven that he identifies as you need to know about these people. Uh, and so if you're interested in learning more, a few of the ones I mentioned are in that book, a few that I haven't mentioned are in there. Uh, that's a good book to pick up. Mm -hmm. The next one is Litvin, Early Christian Martyr Stories. Yeah, so uh, scholar Brian Litvin from Moody Bible Institute in Chicago uh, helped put together a kind of new translations of some of these martyr stories uh, to demonstrate, uh, again, some of the things we've been talking about here uh, is how do Christians read these? How did they interpret them? How did they use them to build up uh, their faith? And then he, he provides some commentary on them as well. It's very helpful. Yeah. Okay, the third one is Smither Mission in the Early Church. Yeah. So Ed Smither, uh, another early church scholar, 
um, who is actually working on a book right now on um, monasticism and missions, kind of how early monastics were missionaries, essentially. Um, and this is part of that book. So if you're interested in just missiology in general, I just thought that was a, a good book, kind of a little bit out related to what we talked about, but also kind of a, a slightly different topic. Um, it, it's a really fascinating read, especially because I think a lot of people don't understand that um, we may not always think about missions was a, has, has been a core being of the faith since the beginning. So, yeah. Uh, next one's McGowan, Ancient Christian Worship. Yeah, okay. That one, uh, I would recommend this book if you just want to get a snapshot, uh, just a quick picture of early Christian worship practices, uh, New Testament, but then also just how did some of these things develop, for better or worse, some things like praying to martyrs and some other things that may have not been a good development. Uh, he, he gives a good um, just summary of some of these things, and, it, and it's really a fascinating read. So. Uh, the last one is Retro Christianity. Yeah. Spiegel, Spiegel yeah. Uh, Michael Spiegel was my master's thesis advisor uh, from Dallas, and he wrote a book. This is a very accessible book. I'd recommend church leaders to buy this. Um, where he explains, he uses church history, he uses theology, but ultimately for a contemporary understanding of how uh, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, and how can we not deny our past, but essentially reclaim it for good, uh, you know, evangelical, modern day uh, church practice. So, okay, yeah. so this is a great time for any of them. Please come and tell me, and we'll work it out from now and have to get you to yeah. your let you have a look. Yeah, all right, well, thank you very much. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, let's close in prayer. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, let's do that. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, let's close in prayer. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Holy God, I do thank you for this day. Father, we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. And we know that you are good. We know that you have given us good things and that you will continue to give us good things. Father, we know and we recognize that you have given us the best thing, which is uh, your son, Jesus Christ. And the salvation that we have in him alone. Father, I pray that this time will be fruitful for all of us, that we would, um, Father, recognize those who came before us um, in, in the right ways and to be thankful for your grace in their lives and recognize the grace that you've given us in our lives, that we may be motivated to endure, be motivated to, um, to encourage those who are suffering now, uh, even in the world, uh, for their faith. And uh, Father, have a, a heart of thankfulness that, uh, that your church um, is um, grounded solely on um, Father Christ and his, and his work and not the things that we've done and that it will continue uh, to exist, continue to be here until Christ returns despite us, despite the mistakes we make, despite the flaws that we have. But would you empower us? Would you use us? Um, and I pray for the people here, the leaders here, that you would use them to build up the church, um, and uh, Father, that they would be faithful to the calling for which they've been called. We thank you for Christ, and we pray this in his name. Amen. All right, have a good night. Take care. <clears throat>